Hey guys, Paul Zamorelli here with VHSCollector.com, here to review a VHS movie, finally. And so, what movie is it that I'm finally going to review? It's going to be The Antichrist from 1991. It's very unlikely that you've ever seen this movie. It's really obscure. Now, there's a lot of movies called The Antichrist, for sure. Um, but uh, <laughs> this is so incredibly obscure and rare and difficult to find and you're probably not going to find any information about this online um, so if you had seen this movie floating around out in the wild at one point I'd be surprised it's just so obscure um, but uh, this was released from Talisman Pictures they are actually the people who made the movie um, it was made right in Nevada now it's an interesting story how I ended up sitting here reviewing this movie I just didn't pull it off a shelf and start. I decided, hey, this is rare and obscure. I'm going to review it. It's a little bit of backstory of how I ended up with this. But I first heard of this movie from 112 Video. I was scanning all their covers a few years ago. And um, this was one of the many covers that I've scanned. And I scanned probably 15,000 video cassettes at 112 Video. And this has a pretty generic horror title, The Antichrist. So I didn't really think much of it. So I scanned it. It eventually ended up on VHSCollector.com. And then... A little while after that, some guy contacted me through Facebook. He tells me that he's been looking for this movie forever, and he wants a review about the movie for his book that he's writing. So he's pretty much said to me, if you have access to this movie, because he found that I had access to it through VHSCollector.com, if you have access to it, could you please write me a review of the movie, and I'll include it in this book that I'm writing. I don't really remember what the book was about, <laughs> but uh, I said, sure. If it's that difficult to find, sure, I'll get around to it and I'll eventually do it. Months go by, and uh, I totally forget about it. And he contacts me again. He's like, are you going to do this for me? Could you please? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. The honest truth is that I just don't go on Facebook that much. Um, I just don't like the social media thing that much. I know some of the hipsters out there pump it into their veins. They live off of it. I don't. I think a few weeks ago I got a message from him again saying, listen, if you're not going to do this for me, just let me know. At that point I was like, oh dude, I totally forgot again. I'm sorry. I'm going to get it for you next week so we can do this, uh, watch this movie and review it or whatever. So I finally get a hold of the movie. Once I get a hold of it, I'm thinking, what is it about this movie that this guy wants to view it so badly. What is it? Um, so I go online and I try to research this movie and I just cannot find any information about it. It's made by a guy named Guy Bodart and uh, I went on to his IMDb page. He has a few credits on there but there's no information about any of the movies that he did. I think there's like 10 credits on there. Five of them have like no information. It has a few casts, like one or two people. But there's no votes, no reviews or anything like that. And now the latest five on his IMDb page say announced or filming. But those have been in production since like 2014 or whatever, so they've never been updated. This guy actually released a trailer for one of his latest movies called All Hallows Eve. And I think he released a trailer maybe in 2014 or 15. Uh, and he had an Indiegogo campaign to try to fund this movie. But out of the $10,000 he was requesting, he only raised 50 bucks. So I still... I can't find a full version of that movie. Maybe it's just was never finished. I don't know. This movie stars Laurel Lay Lanford. She's the daughter of the director, and she appears in most of his movies. She owns the production company that is making Guy Bodart's latest movie, All Hallows Eve. So I guess they're still collaborating, uh, father and daughter. So that's pretty much the extent of what I know about this guy. He made a few small films in maybe the late 80s, early 90s. No one has ever seen them. They have no views or no comments or anything on them. Of those, I think this is the only one that actually has any uh, votes on it. It has 17 votes, but no reviews. Not a lot of information about this movie. So, of course, seeing that on IMDb, I was intrigued. It's really obscure. It's, it's only been released, as far as I know, on this VHS cassette. Independently released. So I knew I had to review it. If you're looking at the cover, and if you look at the back, you could see that this is an exorcist knockoff. It actually has an archaeologist in the movie. Another very exorcist-esque thing about this movie. It just almost mimics the exorcist. It's not exactly the same, but it's so freaking close. Uh, it's not in black and white. The cover shows black and white. So this was actually shot on film, but it looks like it was edited on video. Because when a film is edited on video, it creates this really weird aesthetic where it looks like film, but it kind of looks like video. 
And I'm pretty positive that was edited on video, probably using two tape decks. Because in some of the cuts, there's a little distortion in the tape. Kind of clues you in that this was not spliced together. Um, this film looks very amateurish. It feels very, uh, someone got a hold of a camera and he's like, eh, I'm just going to play around with the camera and try to make a little movie. There was no sound recorded for any of this movie. And you could tell that from the sound work on this, it was all done in post. And it is so incredibly bad. The movie doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but that's because they never planned on recording any audio on the set during the shooting of this movie. But the most entertaining part of this is the Foley work on the movie. The sound effects are so bad, they don't sync with what's happening in the movie. They're so loud, and they put sound effects for even the littlest things that are happening in the movie. A girl drinking water, you'll hear like big gulps. Like, it's just so exaggerated. And you could tell that it, it wasn't intended to be a funny movie. It's just they were trying their best to just cobble this movie together. So the movie starts with a dig in Africa and a girl gets possessed there. Then it flashes 23 years later in Palestine. This guy digs up a little ancient statue. He ends up taking it back to Las Vegas and a girl gets uh, possessed from it. it feels very exorcisty, right? And from there, the first 45 minutes of the movie just feels so padded. There's a scene of the main girl gets possessed. She's hanging out at a gym. And I'm thinking, what's the point of this? She's there for about like 10 minutes, just watching her work out. Doesn't really add anything to the movie. There's a scene of her and her roommate and the paper boy playing frisbee. The paper boy has this weird role in this movie. He just pops in and out. One scene where he goes to these two girls' house. He's probably like 14 years old and just like sleeps over their house. I guess to hang out with him. In one scene, he's in his underwear sleeping with one of the girls. It's just just bizarre because you're first introduced to him as the paper boy. He's delivering papers to their house. But of course, everything is made more bizarre and strange with the weird dubbing of the movie. It seems like one of the actresses, probably Laura Lay Lanford, I think she does the voice for the two female leads in the movie because one sounds like a normal voice, but one sounds like a high-pitched fake voice. So I'm guessing that it was the same actress or same woman who did the, the audio recording or the dialogue recording for the movie. And to make the voice sound different, she just spoke so it just sounds ridiculous it's like something out of one of those uh, Italian horror movies because this was shot on film by what appears to be an amateur most of the movie seems well most of the movie is exposed fairly well but there's a lot of scenes that are underexposed they're really dark you can't really see what the heck's going on and some of it's very jarring because you'll be watching a scene that was during the daytime and a few of the inserts are really dark it just seems like they didn't try to lighten it or maybe they couldn't lighten it it just looked so terrible that's the first 45 of the min minutes of the movie her at the gym oh there's just more to it than the first 45 minutes there's a lot of demonic moaning in this movie a lot, you ever, I'm sure you guys saw The Evil Dead. The Evil Dead was certainly an inspiration for this too. This is like a weird, bizarre mix of The Exorcist and The Evil Dead. You remember those POV shots of the demons in the woods in The Evil Dead? They're kind of like swooping camera shots and you hear all this demonic growling and moaning. For the first half of this movie, you see a lot of that. And at some points, that demon that we don't see, we just see the POV shot and hear the moaning. They chase this girl around the neighborhood. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. It happens so much. It's so overused and overplayed. So eventually the girl is at home. After being chased around the neighborhood by this invisible demon or whatever, her roommate comes home. You'd think that the first thing she would tell her roommate is that she's terrified. Some evil force or growling creature is following her all over the place throughout the neighborhood and in the house. What does she say? She's like, hey, I'm ready to go party at the casino. So that's more padding. Now we got a scene of them going to Vegas, going to a casino. We don't see anything inside the casino. They just walk in and we get abrupt cut and they're walking back out. So it, it does not feel like there's any passage of time there. But I think the whole Vegas scene is so that she could bump into the professor, the person who was digging in uh, Africa. She bumps into him and says, oh, I feel like I know him. I really don't know what the relationship is. I'm really confused about it. It's explained a little bit later in the movie, but because of the professor's thick accent and because the sound on this is so terrible, it's hard for me to really grasp what's going on. So that night when she comes home from the casino is the night she becomes possessed. The weird paper boy is sleeping over because his parents are gone. You think his parents would give him a key, but they just leave a note on the door saying, hey, we're not home, and he goes to sleep over these two girls' house. So he's there sleeping on the couch. And then everything starts shaking, and he thinks it's an earthquake. He says in a funny voice, earthquake, earthquake. When they go into the room, they see that the girl 
I forget her name in the movie, she's possessed. So it's the middle of the night and this paper boy runs out to get help because obviously there's something wrong with this girl. Who does he bump into but a priest in the middle of the night? This priest is also the guy who's the professor, the archaeologist who brought the weird statue. He brings the priest back and for the next 20, 30 minutes of the movie, the priest is throwing holy water on the girl. He's reading scripture and at one point, another demon appears. It's the same girl, but I guess it's like another version of her. She wakes up the paper boy and her friend in the bed. They freak out and they scare her off with a cross or whatever, so that disappears. He eventually gets rid of the evil spirit, or so he thinks, by smashing the statue. I wish he would have just done that in the first place. You know, if you feel, if you know that this is a demonic statue, just destroy it from the get-go. <laughs> but uh, as soon as he destroys it, the demon or the devil goes away. So everything is better. He leaves. While he's walking away from this apartment, the demon comes back as the girl. And she has a knife and she stabs him to death a bunch of times and the priest lies there dying in the street. So that's The Antichrist. It's not a very interesting movie. It's charming in the way that it's so amateurish that it's almost like a love letter to The Exorcist or maybe The Evil Dead as well because it just has something similar to The Evil Dead. Little independent production which never really got anywhere. I'm surprised that they never went with some major distributor with this but they decided to release it themselves. Probably would have made more money with a major distributor. Because, I mean, if Nick Millard could get his stuff released, um, certainly they could have gotten this released. Because this is on par with that. Well, this is a little bit better than a Nick Millard film, so. At least it's shot on film. So, this has been Paul, finally, with a VHS review. And I hope to do more. i got a whole stack of them that I want to review. And uh, keep a lookout. I'm always looking for really obscure, out-of-print stuff. And this certainly uh, qualifies. A lot of movies are being released on Blu-ray, and they totally skip DVD, and they're going straight to Blu-ray. It's amazing. Um, but there still are a few movies like this floating around, really obscure ones that have not been viewed or discovered by many people. So um, keep a look at it. I did find a few, and we're going to delve right into those and see what's going on with them <laughs> uh, and try to learn why they've been lost for so long. So this has been Paul with VHSCollector.com, and I'll see you guys next time. Hello, Terry. I am Joseph Bauer, and I'd like to help you. I don't need your help. Well, that's not what I think. What are you doing here? How did you hurt yourself? Terry, is there someone inside you? I am not Terry. Then, who are you? You don't have any idea, Father? Am I supposed to know you? No. Tell me who you are. In time. Did you do that? Maybe. <laughs>